Hey everyone, um, thanks for having me. And I'd also like to thank Tefra for not, not only hosting the exhibition, What Makes the Earth Shake, but for their continued support and for allowing me um, this opportunity to speak to all the young artists who have produced works of their own in response to the exhibition, What Makes the Earth Shake. Um, you know, it's funny, as I did a first um, read through or viewing of the exhibition um, through the images that Janelle sent me, I was really quite taken with the amount of color, you know, deployed throughout the images you guys produced. And particularly the sense of co color-filled painting. You know, like so many of these images depicted what I'm assuming to be the maker or the individual who produced the image um, reading inside of the painting within oftentimes privileging a singular color. And it was great to see you know, my love for color field painting and the history of color field painting, my love of color being, you know, championed alongside all of you as well. You know, it's beautiful to see all of those images because it really spoke to the heart of my project and the project that I set out to have as um, an artist from the moment I graduated from grad school. Um, and it was that I wanted to think about images of black subjects and moments of leisure in conjunction with critical theories around color and art history and recognizing that leisure is, has the ability to produce earthquakes for the black subject. And so leisure becomes a surreal force, right? And color for me also has that kind of surreal quality or the magical quality in it, the language of color does. And seeing all of you, you know, living these lives full of color engrossed in a book was really heartwarming to me because those are the kinds of images I would like to encounter more often. Those are the kind of scenes I would like to see more often. But, you know, the title of the exhibition, What Makes the Earth Shake, it pulls from um, an open letter that James Baldwin wrote to his nephew in the book The Fire Next Time, which, I mean, I'm not sure if any of you have read it yet, but I hope that you guys encounter that book or at least seek it out because I think it's quite beneficial and one that we should all, you know, turn to. But in the book, there's an open letter that James Baldwin writes to his nephew in which he outlines the conditions of the black man um, as, he, as he saw it in Harlem in the 70s. And what was interesting to me was that he oftentimes utilized surreal language to describe the conditions of the black subjects there. You know, um, there were a couple images that also stood out to me that you know, spoke to this idea as well. In particular, this idea of um, producing a dreamscape for oneself or engaging with um, one's favorite fictionalized character. And that to me is also a part of this leisure project, right? Creating a space for the imagination, which oftentimes produces um, or presents itself in you know, moments of boredom or stillness. Um, these are the spaces in which we start to imagine you know, imaginary friends or fictionalized characters are you know, communing with our thought. You know, they're playing around in our imagination. That's where they're living. And thinking about the spaces in which our dreams, you know, live, to me is a beautiful idea because that is a consciousness that we have, you know, a relationship to build with. I think oftentimes we, we become really engrossed and encapsulated by the conditions of the reality in which we engage with every single day, you know, and how disheartening and how turbulent it can be to navigate the society. And really to think about how complicated just life is, you know, the conditions of being a human being and navigating the world, occupying, occupying the bodies that you have. I mean, this is why, where the fictional is most useful, right? And thinking about, you know, allowing ourselves to be inactive and to just be bored. You know, to really contemplate and to measure, you know, the direction in which we're, you know, we're guiding our lives, reconsidering our guiding principles, so to speak, and thinking about this in tandem with the power, the power of the imaginary. And that, for me, is something that is really, you know, not only important to like, you know, the world of art or my love of creativity, but really to my life. Like you guys will be surprised at how often I talk to fictionalized characters in my head. And, you know, it sounds a little, you know, crazy or a little, you know, but it really is a way of enhancing a dialogue with oneself because the fictionalized characters that we privilege or 
our ability to escape within the land of dreams, you know, develops, allows us to, you know, pick up a language or to, to develop a language to describe or to articulate what it is that we're seeing in those imaginary spaces, in our, you know, what Sarah Lewis calls our private domains, you know, these interior worlds that we are, you know, constantly building. And what I also would like to, you know, make note of, and that I appreciate it as I view the work that you guys produce, is that you all have very beautiful interior worlds. You know, as a child growing up myself, you know, the inner reality of my life was perhaps the most secure place in, on the planet to me, that and like, you know, the company of my mom. Like nothing's more secure than like your parents, right? If, especially if they, you know, they love you well. And so um, I think that recognizing the power of the interior world and nurturing it is something I would like to encourage all of you to do, is recognizing the beauty that you have both, not only externally in the life that you've been given, but internally as well and adopting a language to describe how it is that you see the world. You know, what exactly is your dreamscape? You know, and why is it that we should be invited there? You know, and what are the powers there? How does it enrich the lives that we currently have? How does it subvert our expectations of who it is that you, we think you are? And so thinking about that, and that's why I think, you know, the power of creativity is so important. You know, not only because of its relationship to the private domain or the nurturing of one's interior reality, but it really does allow ourselves to remain imaginative, you know, in terms of our, you know, constructive or critical relationship to one another, but also to the larger social conditions that we find ourselves in. And, you know, as it goes to, you know, the black subject or, you know, any collective or minor, minority group, is that these individuals have to chart out, you know, new realities for themselves every single day. Like their lives are in a space of which, you know, constant negotiation is basically, you know, a consistent theme that doesn't go anywhere. You know, it's something that, you know, you have to negotiate. It requires your attention. It's something that, you know, forces you to reconsider and to recontextualize. Oftentimes that's extremely difficult to do when you're, you know, you're going throughout the busyness of life. Um, but going back to the point I made earlier about the um, interior realities and the power of nurturing them and why I think that's significant. You know, I'm preparing for an exhibition um, in my hometown. And as I prepared for this exhibition, one thing that really struck me were the environments that kind of ignited or gave a spark to what I come to understand as my passion, my love of creativity. And as I was talking amongst friends and talking with a particular curator, um, we talked about why is it that I focus a lot on the interior lives of the subjects in my paintings, you know, whether it be thinking about the beauty of the subject themselves or the magical environment that they are conjuring through engaging with a book. Um, and it really is quite a, real, a simple answer for me. You know, um, for me, it's really just this belief that the interior life that we have is our most protected life. You know, it's our most secure life. And through producing images and through studying, you know, color, there's a way in which I can produce these inner realities and, you know, allow other individuals to peer into that space and to perhaps, you know, extend their understanding of what it is that they might want or might be interested in in themselves. Maybe it's color theory, but maybe it's a book, maybe it's the art object in its totality. But these are things that I consider quite a bit. And as you guys go out into the world, I'm not sure exactly what you know, direction you'll take in life or where you know, your past will take you. Um, but I hope that you do nurture the passion that you find yourself having. And be aware of where you are. You know, constantly pay attention. You know, and <laughs> thinking of paying attention, one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver, has a great poem in which she, has, she states the instructions for living a life, in which she states three rules. Pay attention be astonished and tell about it. And I would like to impart that out, you know, those words to all of you as well. And again, thank you all for having me and thank you for responding to my work. It really does mean a lot. As someone who is working alongside all of you, I'm, I know I haven't had the privilege to meet any of you yet, but I hope that our paths cross. And I hope that, you know, my work continues to speak to all of you. And I hope that I get to see work that any of you all produce that, you know, calls out to my world as well.
until then, um, have a great week. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. And I'll see you around.